since Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like a sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like a sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Good morning. Should we look to the Lord in prayer? God and our Father, we thank you for the lives that you've given us, uh, the eternal life that you've given us that continues all the way for eternity, the, the very life of God that dwells in us through faith in Christ, through new birth. Hallelujah. How we thank thee, O God. And we thank you for your word. Thank you for the fellowship amongst the saints of God. May we have good fellowship around thy word this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So David, uh, the shepherd king, uh, this is entitled The Tale of Two Hands. The Tale of Two Hands. We last saw King Saul acting in the character of a mafia boss and uh, ordering a hit upon David. 1 Samuel 19.1 and Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. Saul was sure that life would be sweeter without David. And many times have we not shared in Saul's thought process? Oh, not that we would resort to ordering someone's execution, but have we not each of us at times been convinced that we would be better off without a particular person in our lives. It may be a person at work or someone at church or sadly, maybe even our spouse. Of course, we could expand this thought, not just to include people, but situations in our lives too. It is a symptom of the fall of man that we tend to deal in what might be or could have been instead of accepting God's sovereignty in our lives. And so we manipulate. We devise plans as to how to distance ourselves from that annoying person and or how to change some uncomfortable situation in our lives. But God says in Romans 9.20, Nay, but O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? God is indeed the potter and we the clay. He is the master craftsman who uses the spinning wheel of our circumstances. I repeat, who uses the spinning wheel of our circumstances, and that includes both people and situations to shape us for his glory. So instead of being like Saul and trying to remove the Davids in our lives, those whom we see as competition or problematic, let us ask the potter to use this person or this situation to shape the clay of our lives for his glory. Amen. Always remember that it is the potter's often unnoticed foot pushing the potting wheel pedal, which causes the potter's table to spin so that the clay can be shaped. And so it is the often unrecognized power of God which causes the wheel of circumstance to spin in our lives. And he determines at what speed the wheel spins. Sometimes he changes things more quickly than at other times. 
but always his hand remains upon the clay and he never deviates from his purpose design. Indeed, God directs the moment by moment affairs of all men. His wisdom is perfect and his ways past finding out glory. Verse two, but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David saying, Saul, my father seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself unto the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside thee, my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee and what I see that I will tell thee. Verse four, and Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul, his father, and said unto him, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee very good. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? Jonathan delighted much in his friend David. He purposed to stand in the gap between his father and David. He argued a good case. Dad, can we talk about this? First, David is your servant. Second, he's not sinned against you. Third, he has worked for your good. He risked his life and slew the Philistine. He gained a great victory for all Israel. Remember how happy you were, Dad. Dad, David hasn't done anything wrong. Will you kill an innocent man? Jonathan was a good man, a godly man but he had a blind spot concerning his dad. He definitely did not understand just how far his father was from God and from righteousness. Love is often this way. We can be blinded to the depth of the character flaws in those closest to us, those we love most. We tend to excuse or to justify the failure of our loved one or friend believing that they will change or that we can change them. Tragically, this can lead to people to accept truly abusive relationships, but abuse is never okay. This seems to be Jonathan's mistake. In his love for his dad, Jonathan thought he could persuade him to change his attitude of heart toward David. Jonathan was convinced that by reasoning with his father, Saul would come around. It is a common mistake to love someone so much that you lose objectivity. Jonathan's father's mind is twisted by envy. This was Saul's choice. He had flung open the door to his soul and yielded to powerful demonic manipulation. Saul had turned from Samuel's pious counsel and God had left him. No, Jonathan, remain with your father and you will further enable his madness. Remain with him and because of your love for David, his anger will turn against you. Remain with him and you will partake of his ruin. Verse 6, And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, And Saul sware, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. Just like old times. Yes, just like old times. Nothing has changed. David is still a hero, verse 8. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. And Saul is still a loose cannon zero. Verse 9, And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence. And he smote the javelin into the wall. 
and David fled and escaped that night. This is indeed the tale of two hands. Saul's hand plays with his javelin and David, David's hand plays with his lyre. One hand is connected with a heart full of envy, hate, and the horrific cry of demons. And another hand is connected with a heart full of contentment, love, and the joyful song of heaven. One hand will in a moment cast the javelin of death, and the other hand will soon take pen in hand and write a psalm of victory. One hand will soon grip a sword to fall upon it in suicide, and the other hand will hold the royal scepter. The tale of two hands, the tale of two men, and the tale of two destinies. Verse 11, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. David actually wrote a psalm describing his feelings of distress as he hid in his house from Saul's hitmen. Psalm 59 is David's prayer to God for help. The psalm's inspired heading reads, To the chief musician, Mishtam of David, when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill him. David's prayer begins, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Verse 1. And David ends his prayer, verse 16. But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and my refuge in the day of my trouble. Verse 17. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. So this psalm is David's faith confession as he stealthily slides to the ground from a window. If we read only the psalm and did not know David's method of escape, we would surely conclude that God had given David strength to defeat Saul's henchmen or that God had caused them to flee in fear. How instructive to see that a leap from a window can actually be a leap of faith. Both the window and David's swift sprinting were evidence to David of God's mercy and his defense. There are times when the better part of valor is to flee. The Lord Jesus spoke of counting the cost. He said in Luke 14, 31 and 32, Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he send an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. David counted the cost and determined that he could not win this fight. He decided that there were no conditions of peace that Saul would accept. So David fled. David's fight with Goliath centered in the public defense of God's glory against a Philistine. There he fearlessly attacked. But this is a personal assault against himself and that by the Lord's anointed king, Saul. David humbles himself and thanks God for the window and his youthful legs. Believers can sometimes tend to be dogmatic as to how they think God would handle a particular situation. We should remember that God's ways are past finding out. Believers should not assume that God will act supernaturally. He receives glory by working through the natural too. Esther won a beauty contest and became queen. King Ahasuerus couldn't sleep one night. He thought he could go to sleep by reading the daily palace minutes. There he discovered that Mordecai had saved the king from assassination. This led to Mordecai being honored. And because of Mordecai's promotion 
and through Esther's intercession with the king, the whole Jewish population was saved. Nehemiah was cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. One day the king asked why he looked sad. Nehemiah prayed, and God gave him favor with the king, and the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. Caesar wanted to increase his wealth and fund his army. His census, which was in view of future taxation, forced Mary and Joseph to travel to Bethlehem. In this way, God fulfilled the prophecy that the true king would be born in Bethlehem. So yes, we can stand with David and praise God for his provision of the window and swift legs. Verse 13. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, Why hast thou deceived me so, and sent away mine enemy, that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go, why should I kill thee? And you might have thought that your family was dysfunctional. It's a testimony of God's grace that godly Jonathan was raised in Saul's home. But now we see just how ineffective Jonathan's intercession was with his father. When demons govern a man or woman, only the delivering power of God can bring release. But as we mentioned last week, Saul had opened the door to the devil through his envy and jealousy. Of this sin, he will never repent. So he remains chained in the prison house of pride and corruption. There is a saying, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Saul sowed the thought of envy and he reaped an action of violence toward David. Saul sowed an act of violence, and he reaped a habit of violence. Saul sowed a habit of violence, and he reaped a character of hatefulness toward David and anyone that was on David's side. Saul sowed his character of hatefulness and reaped a destiny from which his tears still cannot deliver him. So Michael protects David and helps him escape. But as we shall see later, Michael is only infatuated with David. Like her father, she later will turn from him. And now a tidal wave of animosity against David is rising in Saul's spirit. Verse 15, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. Saul commands his servants to bring David on his sick bed so that he can kill him. Bitterness and hate are eating Saul up on the inside like an aggressive cancer. And they will do the same to anyone who opens the door of their heart to the sins of envy, jealousy, bitterness, or unforgiveness. It is certainly a most miserable way to live and an even more miserable way to die. Now Saul accuses his daughter Michael of betraying him. David is, of course, her husband. But for those, like Saul, who are bound in the cords of bitter enmity, undivided loyalty must be yielded to them. Anyone who has witnessed painful strife among family or mutual friends understands that each side in the conflict demands you side wholly with them. Seeking to be a peacemaker in such discord requires much grace and wisdom. And with unstable people like Saul, peacemaking may seem 
an impossibility. Verse 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. Samuel had anointed both Saul and then David. Samuel knew Saul well. No doubt he was not surprised as David related his experience. Remember that Samuel had feared Saul would even kill him if he became aware that he was going to anoint David. 1 Samuel 16, 2. Notice in this time of great necessity, David went quickly to a spiritual man. He needed comfort and he needed direction. He needed the seasoned words of Samuel. Most probably, David didn't go to his father, Jesse, so as not to put his family in peril. It is sad how often professing believers that are in distress will A, try to figure it out on their own, B, resort to friends who are most often ill-equipped to give good godly guidance, C, put out some cry for help in a social media post, or D, just become depressed and do nothing. If you happen to be in a hard place right now in your life and you are struggling, do not hesitate to do as David did. Go to an elder brother or sister for help. One of the purposes of biblical eldership is to help and guide the hurting. Believers are sheep. Go first to the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, and then to an under shepherd, an elder. And if you have friends who are seasoned in their walk with Christ, you are indeed blessed. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. How good to develop godly relationships. We need friends that will hurt us with the wounds of love when we have walked out of the Lord's way. Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And we need friends that can counsel with the wisdom that is from above. Proverbs 27, 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Now, a most amazing incident follows. If anyone has any question as to the God's ways being past finding out, they need look no further than the following verses. Verse 19. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is Naoth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then went he also to Ramah, and came to a great well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are in Naoth and Ramah. And he went thither in Naoth and in Ramah. And the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied and he, till he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? What a perfectly clear witness to Saul that God is in opposition to his madness against David. Saul's servants return three times, but instead of returning with David, they returned with testimonies of the power of God coming upon them. Saul had himself experienced the power of God coming upon him to prophesy. For Samuel 10 10. And he had also experienced the power of an evil spirit coming upon him to prophesy. Chapter 18, verse 10. Could he not discern the difference 
between the power of God and the power of the devil. The devil may speak favorably toward God and his servants, but only to gain some advantage. Acts 16, 16 and 17. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought our masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out, came out that same hour. But though the demon within this possessed damsel speaks of the Most High God and the way of salvation, it is only to be identified with Paul in the eyes of the people. Soon the savage wolf within her would shed the sheep's clothing and viciously tear at the flock. Paul was grieved with his corruption, cast out the spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus. There is absolutely no submission to God, nor the Lord Jesus, by demons. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So Saul might at one moment be under the influence of the Spirit of God, and at another moment under the influence of the devil. The point is that God is upon the throne and supreme. And if a man or woman does not yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, they will be like the waves of the sea, tossed and tormented by the mighty winds of domination. Having no anchor, having no security, and ultimately having no hope. God will do as he will with any vessel of wrath who fits himself for destruction by opposing the Almighty. Let stubborn Pharaoh be a witness. Let the corrupted and covetous Balaam be a witness. Let Judas add his testimony. These, along with a host of others, fitted themselves for the eternal destruction of the damned. Saul may lay prostrate and prophesy before Samuel now, but he will soon rise and continue his relentless and cruel pursuit of David. For Saul knows with certainty that God has weighed him in the balance and has found him wanting. Saul knows that David is the man after God's choice, his true anointed. And he knows that his kingship cannot stand as long as the son of Jesse lives. And herein, was the real source of the animosity of the religious leaders toward the Lord Jesus. His miracles bore witness that he was God's anointed, the true Christ of God. Just as David was a threat, so the Lord Jesus was a threat to the religious leaders. John 11, 47, 48. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. And if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. His miracles they could not deny. But that did not stop them from denying him. Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him was their hateful cry to Pilate, John 19, 15. These wicked men, along with Herod, the depraved murder of babies, were troubled ever since the wise men announced his birth. And the prince of this world, the devil, inspired every evil design against him, from the manger of Bethlehem to the cross of Calvary. Revelation 12, 4. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as he was born. Luke twenty two fifty three, When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. 
The long suffering of God ran its course with Pharaoh. Balaam, Saul, Judas, Herod, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they were damned. If you are without Christ, you are fitting yourself for eternal destruction in every moment you live. Repent. We beseech you, repent. Why will you perish? Trust Christ now for your own soul's sake. Trust Christ now. God loves you. Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins. Trust Christ. Repent and trust Christ. Amen. Our God, we thank you for your word and your son and the salvation that he offers to all men. For all of us that know this salvation, this Savior, we thank and praise thee. And we pray for those that might be listening, anyone that's never received Christ, never repented of their sins, never crowned him as the Lord and King of their life. My friend, it's either crown him or crucify him. Make your decision now. But we pray you'll repent and make him the king of your heart. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.